All right, welcome back, folks. We're talking about algorithms and Turing completeness. So Alan Turing was one of the most important computer scientists of his generation of the history of computer science. And he had an idea for a particular machine. So let me try to describe a machine. Back in his day, they were talking about what things are computable, what can be computed and what can't be. And so he was trying to come up with what's the simplest machine that has just as much power as any machine does. So he didn't call it, I'll call it out name after myself, the Turing machine. He just described a machine and only later did people, other mathematicians and other computer scientists realize that was a powerful notion and they named it after him. Here's the idea of the machine. It's a, if you've ever seen a reel-to-reel -reel tape, okay, like reel here, a read right head here, and another reel here. You can go left and right. You can forward wind, backward wind, okay? That tape is infinite. So imagine it being not just a big coil of tape, but actually it's infinite. And on the tape are only zeros and ones, but now you know about zeros and ones in binary. So it's a language in binary, but that's fine, okay? Infinite tape. And all you can do at every step is Move the tape to the right, move the tape to the left, read the value on the tape under the head, or write a value, 0 or 1, under the tape. That's all you can do, period. The symbols are 0 and 1. You can read, write, and move it left and right. That's all you can do. And there's a little bit of a brain. It's a little bit of a, we're going to see it's called a finite state machine. There's a little bit of a brain, a little bit of an algorithm in the back that is determining what to do based on what you read, like, just like a program, right? If I read a 0, then I. Do I write a 1? Do I move it left? Do I move it right? Okay, or do I stop? Okay, so that makes sense? So I have a basic set of the things that you might do based on reading the head. You might say, okay, if I read a 1, go write three times. Right, right, right. And now look what one that is again. Okay? So this idea of a Turing machine is really powerful. And one of the things that he proved was that you can simulate any computer algorithm with a Turing machine. Like, wait, come on, come on, Dan. No, oh really? No, come on, please. Yes. So you could have find max in a list, and you'd somehow encode the list onto the tape, somehow. You'd encode the find max algorithm in the brain part of it, and it would, based on the tape, zeros and ones, spinning right and left, reading what it, what it is, read under the head, okay, left, left, okay, oh, it's a one, okay, right a zero, right, right. It could actually find the max in a list. How about page rank? It could do page rank. How about edge rank? It could do that. It can do any algorithm you've seen, any algorithm period, that Turing machine can do it. That's a powerful, powerful idea. How is that related to the languages, though? You just, you just built a machine. You built this fake machine as a, in the lab. That doesn't tell me about languages. Aha! How about this idea? Imagine, if you will, the encoding of the brain Remember the, what, like the kind of the algorithm itself, the what you do, the left, right, blah, 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 as being encodable in ones and zeros. It's not crazy. Okay, it's not crazy. So you encode the algorithm itself into ones and zeros. On the tape is the data. So now you have two things. You have the program, ones and zeros, and you have the data, ones and zeros. Now, watch this. I'm able to put the program and the data, they're both ones and zeros, right, on another tape. Stay with me, right? I'm going to propose a new type of machine called the universal Turing machine, not just a normal Turing machine that works on a particular problem. It's like having, a, uh, it's like having mobile apps, right? You can, load up, you can load anything you want to do. I, have, I want to play Angry Birds. Zoop, I load in Angry Birds. I'm playing Angry Birds on Angry Birds data. Angry Birds program on Angry Birds data, right? You kind of load program and the data for it, right? So imagine this universal Turing machine is one in which you can, on the tape, encode both the program and the data in a general way. This is called the stored program concept, where you store the program with the data together. And now what the universal thing does is it says, I'm going to now spin the tape, bloop, 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 read the program in, and slide over, read the data, and run that program on that data. See how amazing? That's why it's called universal. You can now run any program on any data. Right? Isn't that amazing? Like, your brain should be hurting this point. Why? Because Turing showed any language that can simulate a universal Turing machine, right? So it can pretend like there's a tape and pretend that you are reading from the tape and doing something, okay? Turing showed that any language that can simulate a universal Turing machine is called Turing complete. 
He just named that. And any language that's Turing complete is equally powerful to all other languages that are Turing complete. What an amazing result that was. What it says is that someone comes into your lab, to your house, to your home, and says, I came up with a new language. It's way more powerful than any other language. And you say, no, that's impossible. Because of the rule of Turing completion, the idea that we now have proved that there is no higher level of power. All languages that are Turing complete are equally powerful. Can the language, can your, hey, Mr. Smarty Pants, can that language simulate a universal Turing machine? Why, sure it can. Well, so can mine. So you're no more powerful than I am. Done. They're like, oh, they walk away with the head down. Okay? Now, I'm going to go rogue now. Watch this. I'm going to pull my wallet out. This wasn't planned. In my wallet, I contain, I keep with me, this is a special thing, this. This, I'll try to hold it to be focused. This was done by Albie Ray Smith. This is a plastic card. Okay? We're going to have places on the link to be able to download this and print it yourself. This plastic card is a universal Turing machine. Like, what? Yes, it has four states. One, two, three, four. And on the tape, you're going to have the numbers one through six, or blank and one through five. And you take a tape, and you take this, and you place it down. It says, OK, if it's a five, move it to the right and turn this way. You see? And this one says, OK, now, now read the, there's a new rule. Because I've turned it, now there's a new rule set. OK, now what's on the table? Oh, now it's a four. Four says, oh, cross it off and write a three and move it left and turn this way. And so this is basically changing the states of the brain. This encodes the universal Turing machine. Your hands are the embodiment of it. So your hands are actually the mechanical. But, that, but the intelligence is here. You're just following the rote script of doing it. This piece of paper, this piece of cardboard flyer, is a universal Turing machine. This is as powerful as any language ever written by mankind or ever will be written by mankind. I'm getting chills. Huh? You're getting chills too? Universal Turing machine. So that's powerful stuff. So the idea, the big picture here is, if you have a language that can simulate a universal Turing machine, meaning read in the program and read in data in some encoding, and run that program on that data, then you are as powerful as every other language ever. Isn't that amazing? Now, not all languages can do that. Some languages are small little languages that do just, I can add and subtract. My calculator can't do that. I can just do simple things. But most languages are very powerful and can do that. So this is really cool. I have a beautiful picture here of a universal Turing machine, or of a Turing machine in general. This tape is zeros and ones. And I have this delightful XKCD comic I want to give props to, which talk about um, uh, there's little, there's little pips that you have, uh, candies at Halloween with the little kind of candies that are dropped on the wax paper. And I think it says that, you know, when I, sometimes I like to just randomly eat them and go left to right, right to right. And sometimes I like to actually make a strip of them and eat them like a Turing machine. Left, 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 right, 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 turn. Right. Joke. Okay, all right. It's funny in the subjects. Okay, so next. In summary, by the way, now that I've shown you the power of this universal Turing machine, let's now summarize the set of lectures you've just seen, which is the concept of an algorithm has been around for a long time and predates computer science. They are well-defined procedures, hopefully in a language that is unambiguous, that allows you to embody the idea of what you should be doing, what that recipe particularly is. When you're writing algorithms or considering algorithms, you need to deal with trade-offs, readability, clarity when you're choosing languages, and when you're choosing algorithms. They have different efficiencies as well. We'll talk about efficiency at the next set of lectures. Each programming paradigm, this is now hearkening back to the last one, each programming paradigm has its benefits in terms of Here's a problem, which paradigm do I choose? Which language in which paradigm do I choose? However, as long as the language is Turing complete, it doesn't actually matter. It'll be just as powerful as every other language. It's just that it can be easier to write the code in or read the code in. All right? That's the end of today's lectures. We'll see you next time talking about algorithm complexity. Take care, guys. <laughs>